uh, Herbert Elfring, and I was with the California National Guard, leveled the 251st Coast Artillery, and it was uh, uh, stationed in California when I, I went in into the guards on, uh, in January 1940 with the battery stationed in San Diego. I joined the National Guard really just to make a few extra bucks on the weekend and uh, went to uh, a camp with the uh, regiment in, in uh, July of 1940 up in, in Washington. Uh, which is a common thing for the National Guard to do every year. Uh, we not just just nicely got home on September 16th, 1940. The California Regiment was uh, uh, activated full time. The first National Guard Regiment activated before we got into the war in 1942. In November 1940, the, uh, the regiment was deployed to Hawaii, specifically the island of, o of Oahu. Uh, fortunately, it, we were gifted to go to Hawaii instead of the Philippines. Because had we gone to the Philippines, I probably would have been on that baton death march. When we got to Oahu, uh, uh, there was no designated spot, you know, where that we could go that was all prepared for us. So we lived in, in tents for uh, a short period and then moved to the location where we where we actually built our own camp with, uh, with the lumber provided. And it was called Camp Malacoli and just a, a few, mil, few miles from Pearl Harbor along the same sh shoreline. I, I was in a searchlight battery, and I think our battery consisted of about 150 uh, men. Uh, there were also other batteries of uh, automatic weapons and also uh, anti-aircraft guns. On a, on a daily basis, of, once we were in Hawaii, it was... Uh, um, Mainly, mainly training and and keeping up the equipment uh, in an operating condition. I I was just a private, so I started off as a a truck driver that carried the searchlight from uh, one location to another as as needed. I I drove the truck that carried the the searchlight, which was of course used for illuminating aircraft at night. Uh, the, the searchlight crew consisted of, I think, eight eight fellows. Uh, it, it required a uh, a power plant operator and and uh, uh, a couple of searchlight operators and and uh, two or three people to stand guard too at the same time. We're not training on a daily basis, but uh, it was. It was uh, really the thing that was our, our goals, really, to be, be prepared for uh, whenever we had to do our job. A uh, normal uh, work week was uh, uh, five days during, during peacetime, and so uh, Monday through Friday. And, uh, and of course, that, that, that varied all over the places as to wherever we were told to go and what to do. And that could vary from uh, being on, on base and off base. Well, on weekends, of course, our, uh, our uh, main venture was to go into Honolulu to the, to the main city. And we, we, we were several miles from the city, so uh, an army truck would furnish transportation for the fellas put on authorized to be on leave to go into the go into town and look around and come home. 
Well, for for a work work day was just uh, fatigues. They were the Doug Reed type at that time, and uh, uh, army 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 shoes, of course. And our, our patch was uh, had a 251st Coast Artillery anti-aircraft labeled, and we could wear that on our on our shoulder patch. Uh, we, we carried rifles and, uh, and at that time it was called an M1. So I was 19 on December 7th, 1941. The Japanese attack only lasted, you know, a few hours. After it was announced that we were being attacked, of course, we, we all went to our uh, assigned positions, which happened to be uh, a, a, a radar used for detecting airplanes and used for directing the searchlights for, for night operation to eliminate airplanes, of course. But uh, uh, it, being, it being daylight, we had no particular reason to direct any searchlights at, 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 at uh, airplanes. So we uh, did, of course, go to our assigned radar position. We we that were working on this new radar that we were that we had acquired, and uh, the radar itself was just a, a short range radar. Uh, uh, I think the limit was forty thousand yards, which was which didn't give you very much time to detect an airplane and and report it. So uh, already the afternoon of December 7th, it was very, very, very quiet by comparison. And, uh, and of course, we got all kinds of rumors as to what the Japanese might be doing, whether they were going to attack land-wise or more air-wise or just what. As it turned out, uh, the Japanese went back to the carriers and took off. Uh, no, no action of any kind by the Japanese from that point on. Well, we we, we continued on with our uh, uh, becoming more acquainted with the with the radar and getting the crews, you know, uh, adjusted to it to, to be able to uh, spot any any aircraft that uh, be coming in if, if we wanted. We did our, from, from the, after the, the attack, we went on with our normal uh, exercises of being prepared for what our job was to be. And uh, we did that until June of 1942. So our whole regiment was deployed to the Fiji Islands, F-I-J-I Islands. And our job, was to defend an air, air, air strip that we had air, recently built on the island. And we were expecting, of course, for the Japanese to uh, invade the island of Fiji. But as it turned out, they never did, they never had the strength to get that far. On Fiji, we were there until uh, about October of 1940. Three. Then we were deployed to the Solomon Islands, and specifically the island of Bougainville. On there, a new airstrip built, and our job was to uh, defend that airstrip. Uh, to the Solomons, we were on the Solomons until uh, about December of 1944, and then we were deployed to the Philippine Islands, specifically the island of Luzon, which is uh, where Manila is located. And we were sent there to uh, defend the, the, Clark, the Clark Field airstrip. The interesting thing that happened on the way from, from uh, Bougainville to the Philippines was uh, one evening we discovered a a Japanese kamikaze plane in the sky. 
and every ship in the convoy was probably firing at this this one 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 plane and the plane finally decided which 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 ship to take and I don't know how many ships that was in our convoy but there was there were several and they were lined up in three rows and when the kamikaze decided which plane to pick out he he picked the the uh the middle row and a ship across from the ship I was on. And uh, I assumed because the plane, every ship in the island on, in the convoy was firing at it, he, uh, by just hitting just behind the ship he was aiming at and uh, broke into flames and sank and no damage to the ship. I think as a young, young service person at that time, you, you just felt that you're there because you had to be because of the war. And being being young, you just went with the, with the requirement, I guess you might say. And I, I never, never really gave it a thought as to, will I ever get home or not, you know? You just, uh, did what you had to do on a daily basis, pretty much, and we had our exciting days, you know, like like when we were on the Philippines, we had, uh, we encountered some Japanese sniper fire, for instance, and uh, one of our fellows was hit by a sniper bullet. And was, uh, I just expected that. You just expected them to happen, so you didn't dwell on it too much. Well, I had an offer to go to uh, Officer's Candidate School when we were on the island of Fiji. They were in need of officers. The service uh, set up their own Officer's Candidate School in, in the, on the island of Fiji in two, two, se two sessions. And uh, I, was, I was selected out of our, our, our battery to go in the second session. Commissioned a second lieutenant in during 1943. It was quite a quite a challenge to leave your outfit as as a enlisted man. I was a I'd gone from private to corporal to sergeant, buck sergeant to staff staff sergeant before I was uh, selected to go to OCS. But it's uh, it was quite a challenge to come back to the same outfit, you know, and and uh, supervise the buddies that you had, you know, as a as a good friend and the same rank and all. I I went from private in 1940 to captain in 1945 uh, on what was, what was called a point system, and I had. After having been in the South Pacific for so many years, I had 125 points accumulated. So I, I chose to be reassigned back to the United States in, in, in July of 1945. I was uh, accepted for that and uh, uh, was uh, a month on, on board ship sailing back to the U.S. from, from the Philippines. And the most touching thing that I can remember ever up to that point was to sail underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. After, after over five years being gone, it was a thrill of a lifetime. I went right to my home in Montana, and I was there on leave on uh, 1945 in August when they dropped the A-bombs on, on Japan. And then I got, I got a, a telegram to report to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas for separation from the service, even before the war ended, to do with what I wanted to do. And I got to Leavenworth, and I thought, well, I don't need to come home again <laughs> right away. I'll, I'll just go on to Florida, visit my, my sister and her husband who lived in Florida, which I did. And at that time, uh, 
the military seemed to have more 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 planes to fly than they knew what to do with <laughs> and it was easy to to actually hitchhike on military aircraft so that's what I did I, I caught a ride to uh, to uh, uh, Eglin Field Florida and then hitchhiked to uh, Banana River Florida where my my sister lived well as a Banana River I thought well wonder how I could get down to Trinidad to see my brother in the Navy <laughs> and uh, uh, I was able to get a, a flying boat out of Banana River down to Puerto Rico. And while I was in Puerto Rico, I was able to get a, a military air transport plane, you know, planes they flew for various reasons just to haul supplies and whatnot. So I got to uh, my brother uh, in the Navy in Trinidad, saw him for a few days. And he was surprised about that, of course, because there's no way to tell him I was coming. It was one of those C-47 type planes that they used for hauling things everywhere. Well, the workforce in the Army. So I caught a, caught, a, caught a plane to Miami, got there in time for a hurricane to hit, hit Miami, and experienced that, of course. And uh, then I hitched like, uh, well, after after the hurricane went through, uh, and I got a day or so, I uh, I hitchhiked back up the Banana River to my sister's place. Stayed there a couple of days, and then and then I was able to catch a ride to Eglin Field, there in uh, the west end of Florida. And then from there, I got to uh, uh, Glen Dive, California. And. On a B-7, on a B-25, and uh, when we landed in Glendive, I, I, I was riding right up in the nose of that plane when we landed, and that was quite a thrill. <laughs> so, the idea was to uh, uh, get back to San Diego from Trinidad. So they had this one plane that they were going to send back to Bremerton, Washington, for some kind of overhaul, and. Uh, by, they were going to go by way of San Diego, where my brother's wife and family lived, and that was where I was headed to. So, uh, and the, the plane came through San Diego as planned, and I got on the plane with the with the uh, pilots and took off for Bremerton, Washington. We got up as far as Long Beach, and it was sucked in there by weather. And uh, and uh, two days of not knowing where I was hardly and uh, and not not a good place to stay. I I uh, went to the uh, air base and uh, caught caught a plane to McCook Field, Nebraska. And from there I hitchhiked back to South Dakota, where my where my sister and her husband were on the farm. So I got back there in time to go pheasant hunting this that fall of 1945. And from there I hitchhiked back to Montana where my folks lived and spent uh, time there until about Christmas, a little after. And then it was time to head for Ann Arbor to, to go to the University of Michigan. Well, I, oh, as it turned out, I discovered there's a, a couple families of elf rings that lived in Ann Arbor. And through them, they got me a place to stay and everything to start the school. So that was a break, that was a great period. Otherwise, I probably would have stayed in a, in a dormitory of some kind. Mm -hmm. I was released from the Army in, in the fall of 1945. And uh, so I applied for entrance into the University of Michigan and started in January 1946. Well, I, I was uh, involved with electrical items uh, involving the radar. Uh, selected uh, electrical engineering as my major in at the University of Michigan. 
So uh, that's that's went along for four years. In the meantime, got married in 1948, but uh, I graduated from the University of Michigan with an electrical engineering degree. And, and, but uh, we older veterans that went back to school at that time, I think we looked at it more as a, a job that we wanted to get get done and get on with our work. And was uh, hired by the uh, Consumers Power Company here in Michigan and uh, headquartered in Jackson. And that's that's where my wife and I moved from, from the campus of uh, Ann Arbor to the city of Jackson in 1940, 1950. I grew up on a farm in South Dakota, uh, specifically near the town of Watertown, South Dakota, in the central eastern part of the state. Uh, about 1931, 32, the, the dry years and the drought hit hit the area, and uh, as a result, uh, my father couldn't raise enough money to pay the interest on the farm, and we lost it. And uh, it broke up the family. I went to stay with my uncle, and my two sisters went to stay with. Uh, another aunt and uncle, and, uh, and my dad stayed someplace, my brother stayed, my mother and the two little the youngest the brother and sister stayed with them in a fa uh, farm family. And then that worked until 1933, and my oldest sister heard about this uh, a uh, project being built in Montana, which happened to be near an aunt, my mother's sister, and my mother's brother, my grandmother, lived in Montana. And uh, my sister said to my dad, you get your, you get your family back together and get on the road to Montana because they're gonna work, start this dam across the Missouri River. That's what we did, and my dad got a job on that project. Sad, sad situation. Grapes of wrath, you know. All, all of our belongings behind an old Buick, behind an old Buick car. It wasn't an easy life, you know, as a kid. But you, I don't remember ever being hungry for some reason. I graduated from the high school in Fort Peck, Montana, 1939. And my, my, my brother uh, in the Navy married. He and his wife invited me to come to San Diego to go to, go to San Diego State. Well, in the meantime, how do you get to San Diego? <laughs> and uh, it just so happened there was a family there that was planning to move to uh, Sacramento. And they had a truck a car and a house trailer. And they needed somebody to drive the truck with a lot of their belongings. And I, and I, I was in 1939 and I was uh, 17. And I drove that international truck all the way from Montana to Sacramento. A family of five kids, three three boys and two girls. They're all doing very well, all married, and uh, all the grandkids are exceptional, I think. <laughs> Real bad hump in the road, I guess, as time went on, was, as my wife obtained uh, Alzheimer's when, when I had, after I'd been retired for quite a while. And, and uh, I took care of her from the beginning of it that she passed, you know. This is a, a cap that uh, uh, the service people wore, except for not, not with all these uh, uh, medals on the side. And it just, uh, it just happens to have the fact that, that I was on, on Hawaii with the Japanese 
hit Pearl Harbor, and as a result, anyone that was attacked by the Japanese, that island, which they just they didn't just attack Pearl Harbor, every military installation on the island was uh, was attacked, uh, big Marines and the and the Navy and the Coast Guard and and uh, and of course all the ships in the in the harbor of Pearl Harbor. So as a result of that, uh, uh, just being attacked by anyone experienced that day could be called a Pearl Harbor survivor. And I guess I could fall into that position by being barely missed two times by a strafing, strafing airplane. It also shows the, the islands that I've been on, which was Oahu, Fiji, Bougainville, and the Philippines. And this is a, a memento I, I got from the University of Michigan for having uh, attended a, first of all, I'm a University of Michigan graduate of 1950, and uh, they invited me back to a football game uh, 2021, last October, and to be veteran of the day. And as a result, I learned that day by 106,000 <laughs> Michigan football fans, and I was given this little memento. I had just mentioned uh, I was uh, a veteran of the day last fall of the Michigan football game. And this little picture here shows previous veterans that were given the same honor of being at a football game and I'm being honored at a, at a game. And there's a total of uh, seven of us that were honored last year. This is a plaque given to me by the legislature at the Michigan in Lansing and it uh, is signed by numerous representatives of uh, the legislature and that happened uh, uh, last, last fall. Like, this is a special tribute to me as a veteran, given by the, the state of Michigan, of course. I graduated from the University of Michigan in, in uh, 1950 and, and became employed by the Consumer Power Company of uh, Michigan and uh, located here in Jackson, Michigan. Uh, my, my wife and I became active in square dancing, active for a little while until our family started coming along and, and uh, that became first, first attention, I guess. But my wife passed in, uh, in 05, 19, 2005, and I uh, saw a notice where I could start square dancing again, which I did and, and have been become very active in in the uh, dance of square dancing. So as a result, they gave me this little, when I when I turned uh, 100 last, last March of 19, or 2022, I was given this uh, certificate of recognition and appreciation by the United Square Dancers of America.